I have a confession to make as we get started this morning. Lots of times as a pastor, you work over a message, you get prepared, and you feel like everything's really neat and tidy, understand it, you have a good comprehension of the scripture. As I studied this passage this week, it's one that I've chewed on all week, and it's one that I still don't think I understand how amazing it is and how complex this one little verse is. John 12, 25 is the the text that we're going to be in today, and we'll, we'll bounce around the whole chapter, but verse 25, I don't think I have a handle on understanding how deep this idea is that Jesus teaches us, and I don't think I have a handle on understanding how to apply this to my life, because basically Jesus makes this statement that we are called to not get caught up in this world, not to lose our life in this world, but actually to hate our life in this world in comparison to him. And that's a hard concept for me to understand because I look at life and I love life. I love my family. I love doing life together with church. There's so many things that I love, but when Jesus says, if you lose your life in this world, that's a negative thing because I think many times, so the, I guess the confession is we're going to learn together through this that I think this is a wrestling passage to understand how do we apply this today. And I'm not there yet, which hopefully that's a good thing, because I'm definitely, um, at times I've had people say that they've left churches over certain things, which is always interesting in our world. But one said, well, I've never had a pastor not let me down. And I was like, and they were visiting a church that I was attending. And I was like, well, um, I don't want to break bad news to you today, but you might as well go ahead and leave, because I'm going to let you down. Uh, I'm not perfect. And so I made that confession because I try to be very honest with people. uh, And I am not a perfect man by any stretch. I am trying the best that I can to follow after Jesus. So we will try together this morning to understand what this passage actually means. But have you ever gotten lost in something? And maybe a book that you just dove into a book and then you looked up and you said, man, I just read that whole book that quickly. And we can do that. Maybe a conversation. I remember in college when Amanda and I first started dating, she was in Brevard, I was in Columbia, and at that time, this will date us a little bit, we didn't have cell phones, so you didn't have, and maybe if you did have cell phones, you had to buy minutes, and you only had so many minutes, but we had this little Sprint card that was 10 cents a minute to talk, and I didn't have a job in college, I would do things, so I would keep track of time, but then at times, we would get lost in our conversation, and we would talk two hours, three hours, and then I'd do the math after, and I was like, oh, gosh, and the only job I really had in college was giving plasma. I would go give plasma a couple times a week and get paid like 80 bucks a week, and I thought that was a lot of money, but I only did that, so it was blood money to pay for me to be able to talk to Amanda. Well worth it. How about a TV show? Uh, We live in a Netflix culture where people will binge watch, that they'll sit down at a TV and look at a a series, and they'll just (laughs) through it. You can get lost in that pretty easy. Uh, I get lost in competition, as you have heard, Uh, pretty quickly. I remember as a student pastor, it seemed like everything that we would do for camp, we would build around competition. And we were having a volleyball, a sand volleyball tournament on the beach. And it was coming down to the championship. And I was on one team and we were playing another team with another set of leaders. And there was, and kids were involved in this, but there was a storm coming up on the, the ocean and you could see it coming in. And in my mind, I was like, we can get this game in. Now, the other leaders, the parents in the group are like, we need to be safe and we need to go in. And it comes down like to like the, the winning point. And this mom panics on me and says, we've got to go in now. And I'm like, we just got one point and this is going to be over. And she panicked and sent everybody in so I can get lost in competition very quickly. I've let that go uh, most of the time. We can get lost in worry, anxiety, fear very easily during the times that we live in. I think we can get lost in addiction. Um, it hurts my heart to be able to talk with someone that truly has lost control of themselves because of addiction. And I just talked with a student not long ago, and he's battling that, drugs, alcohol, and it's just so hard. But it's easy for us to become lost in life circumstances and lose touch with reality. And I think even like students I would see do this a lot, that they lose touch with who they were truly really created to be, that they start pretending to be somebody that they're not to try to please others. I think you can get lost in that in today's world too, of making a good image, making sure that everyone likes you, and you can get lost in that. So there's a lot of different ways that you can become lost. 
but we live in a culture that I think is easy for that. But there's two words that I want us to focus on today, that we're either moving towards being comfortable or we're moving towards being conformable, that we're either pursuing, chasing after being comfortable in life or we're pursuing, chasing after being conformable. Now, conformable can be a bad con- type of conformable as well, as I say that word, because we know Romans 12, 2 says what? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're not called to conform to this world, but then you read Romans uh, eight twenty nine. We read this passage at the beginning. Be conformed to the image of the Son of God. So we're called to be conformed t- unto Jesus. But I think if, if you think about getting lost in things, you're either lost in one of those two places. You're lost in comfort and pursuing being comfortable or conforming to his image. And you think about people, what they pursue in this life. And we live in a world that pursues so many different things, pursuing, chasing, conquering, that they always want the next big thing. But you think about this, and this was a, a song that was written. Isaiah was actually singing. I think he saw my notes. But this is what it says, thinking about what you're pursuing. He says, look, if you had one shot, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, would you capture it or would you just let it slip? And you think about that. If you had one moment to capture everything that you ever wanted, would you seize that moment? And we think, oh, man, everything I ever wanted? But what does that reflect to? It reflects to our heart. Like, would you be satisfied if you could have everything that you ever wanted? Or would you still have that desire for more? more or to be complete if you could seize everything that you ever wanted but that's where the problem lies in our world that no matter what you get what you pursue after the only thing that's going to bring satisfaction is a relationship with God and we find out in John 12 25 what Jesus begins to unpack for us and it says anyone and you can turn with me if you've got your Bibles or follow along anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep eternal life. Now, as you study this, it's interesting to break this down because there's a lot of depth below our English language that we don't understand, but there's really two words for life in this. There's anyone who loves their life and then anyone who hates their life in this world. Those are two different words in the Greek. And as you begin to look at it, one of them is talking about the first one, where we find our identity, what we look to. And then the other type of life is more of a kingdom life that you look at. It's an eternal life. It's a life that doesn't end in this. So when you read at it kind of with that in mind, anyone who loses their life, their sense of identity, they'll lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world, meaning that they're not focusing on the temporary world that we live in, but they're looking towards the eternal, it gives it a little different perspective. I don't normally use this uh, version because it's really not a version of the Bible. It's more of a paraphrase. But sometimes I'll look to Eugene Peterson. He wrote this paraphrase of the Bible in modern language. And as I was looking through this and looking at the different versions and how they broke down the language, I thought he did an interesting job of paraphrasing this verse in John 12, 25. It says, in the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is. So think about someone just gripping on to this world with everything that they have destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. And it's, but it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Because we think in this world that we've got to hold on to everything we have. We've got to protect it. We've got to be comfortable. We've got to make sure that there's security in this world. But what this passage begins to say is that if you hold on to it, it's actually counterproductive. But if you'll let it go and trust God for his faithfulness, then you'll experience real and eternal life. You see why I'm kind of, it's complexing to my heart to look over this passage because it's a tough passage. It's really, the ramifications are extreme. And, but we have to understand what Jesus is saying. I've read verse 25 for us to chew on that for a little bit to understand the context of what's going on in chapter 12 because Jacob did a, a phenomenal job last week of talking about Mary and Martha and Mary anointing Jesus with this nard this really expensive perfume, just a beautiful story. And then right after that, Jesus goes marching into Jerusalem. And the people were ready for Jesus to march into Jerusalem. Now, if you remember the context a little bit, Jesus had kind of spent a little bit of time staying away from Jerusalem. Do you remember why? Because the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were looking to kill him. And so he had kind of retreated from there. 
but now he's marching in. And the people are expecting Jesus to come leading this revolt against Rome. They want a political leader. They're desperate for Jesus to march in to give them freedom from Rome. But really what Jesus is doing when he's entering into Jerusalem, he is marching in to give us freedom from sin. And he is marching in to give his life. Now you think about this. Jesus is all-knowing. He's sovereign, which we can't really comprehend what that means. But he knows, like, I, I want to know what's going to happen this afternoon. I want to know what's going to happen in a few years, like when I think about my daughters and who they're going to date, who they're going to marry. I'd love to know that. I mean, that would just be, like, I'd pay money for that. I'd work for that uh, so that I could go stalk them and hurt them if I needed to. Um, but you think about Jesus. He's all-knowing. He's always existed. He is marching into Jerusalem knowing full well that he is going to pay the price for our sin, that he is going to have the weight, think about this, of humanity's sin rest upon him, that he is going to, which that's the the worst thing, and then that he is going to be separated from the Father for a moment because of that sin. And then you think about the cross, you think about the crucifixion, you think about the ridicule, the pain, everything that he's going to experience, he is walking towards that. And he's walking towards that. So when you, when you listen and you look at John 12, 25, and it says anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep their eternal life, Jesus is not focused on this world. He's focused on, focused on what's going to happen in eternity, laser focused on it which is really remarkable when you see the context of that, that here Jesus doesn't come riding in victorious on this big white stallion with an army is the king that they're looking for. He comes riding in on what? A donkey. And they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, who is the king in high, the most king on high. And what's interesting is they were looking for that Messiah, and they were wanting someone to save them, but they were missing the point that, they, that he had came. Jesus had come to save them from what? Their sin, not from Rome. That he had a much bigger plan in mind. So that brings us to verse 20 uh, in the passage. And so Jesus, the triumphal entry has happened. In verse 20 it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival, They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, Andrew to Philip, and in turn told Jesus. So this conversation happens, and you have to assume that these Greeks were spiritual. They were going to this festival to worship. It was something that they normally did, even though they were not Jewish, that there was a level of interest in what was going on at this festival. And they hear about Jesus, and they want to have this conversation. Now, Jesus, the way that he responds, really, really interesting. Verse 23, he says, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Which that means the hour, the time is now. All this preparation has happened. Now he's going to go to the cross. He's going to give his life. Not have it taken, but give his life for you and for I, for the sins of the world. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Really, really, I'm going to read this because I want you to comprehend and try to dig into what Jesus is trying to say here. Because Jesus always teaches in a very profound way. I think he was the best teacher ever that he uses this illustration that really brings to light what he's going to do. Very truly, I tell you, and let's say kernel, so a seed of wheat falls to the ground and dies. So a seed's not alive, really, when it's at, in the package when we would buy it, when we would buy it for tractor supply, wherever we would get it, it's not alive. But you put it in the ground, what happens to it? It grows, it produces something. And Jesus is saying this in reference to his life, that he is getting ready to offer up his life for the sins of humanity, and he is going to be killed. He is going to be crucified, and he's going to go into the grave, but out of that, what is going to come? that humanity is going to have this opportunity to respond to this message of the gospel of that he is going to make us alive through his life, that he is going to defeat sin that we could not defeat for us, and that is going to pay over and over again. And then in verse 25, he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me, in verse 26, must follow me. How well do you think you, how closely do you follow after Jesus? Is it one of those things that we would have as a kid when our kids got to the age? And Marley, 
she came out of the womb kicking. I mean, she was just everywhere. I mean, in the you could feel Amanda's belly as Marley was in there. It was just constant going. I remember when she was just old enough to walk. We were on a vacation in Panama City, and one of our first vacations. She, but she could walk, and she was quick. She's always been very fast. But our hotel door, our condo door, opened out. So there was like a panic bar, those little panic bars that are on doors that you could hit it, and it just opened. Well, we were in like the living room and the bedroom was where the door was at and we heard a noise. So we go in there and she's opened that door and she is running down that breezeway thinking like she is queen of the world, just like big old grin on her face and that moment. And you've probably felt that as a parent or lost somebody. We were like, oh gosh, because we didn't, we go in the room, we don't know where she's at. And then that instant of just panic sets in. But Marley, after that, we got her one of those little backpacks with a leash on it that we could just pull and keep her back. But I feel like we need one of those at times when following Jesus. How closely do you follow? We need that little backpack thing just to pull us back because we don't follow as close as we need to. So whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. So you see this close connection that Jesus wants to produce in us. If we'll follow him, he is going to be right there. He'll always be with us which the security in that is truly unbelievable, that he'll never leave us, that he'll never forsake us. My father will honor the one who serves me. So the victory for Jesus comes through what? His death. And that that little principle is really important for us because the victory that we will face in this life comes through us dying to ourselves. But that's really, really difficult to do for us to die to ourselves, for us to come to the end of what we would like and su- submit ourselves completely to God. I found this, I guess, it's, I guess it's some poetry written about Alexander the Great and contrasting his life with the life of Jesus. And I found it very interesting this week. It's written by Charles Ross Weed. And it says, Jesus and Ale- Alexander died at 33. One died in Babylon and one on Calvary. One gained all for self and one himself he gave. One con- conquered every throne, the other every grave. When, the, when died the Greek, forever fell his throne of swords. But Jesus died to live forever, Lord of lords. Jesus and Alexander died at 33. The Greek made all men slaves. The Jew made all men free. One built a throne on blood. The other built on love. The one was born on earth, the other from above. One won all this earth to lose, all the earth and heaven. The other gave up all, that all to him be given. The Greek forever died, the Jew forever lives. He loses all who gets and wins all things who gives. See, I just thought that was really interesting, that you look at Alexander the Great, conquered the world, (laughs) I mean, in many different ways. But it was through bloodshed, so many power, honor all these things but jesus was the exact opposite of that and you look at that in the context of this passage anyone who loves their life will lose it any while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep eternal life it's really really fascinating so what does this mean for us today like i think you have to remember that the point the lamb of god jesus came to do what to take away the sin of the world So he's marching into Jerusalem. That's his focus, that his death is going to be our victory, that he is going to pay that price. And he is going to do that through going into the ground, the seed, and it's going to produce this multiple fruit that we can't even begin to imagine. And John Piper says this about this passage, and I broke it down because I think it's just so interesting. But here is the destination is eternal life, and you can miss it by loving your life. So you can miss eternal life by loving your life. That is, by making your goal in this life to be safe, secure, comfortable, surrounded by those pleasant things. That's what's so perplexing about this, isn't it? Because that's the American dream, right? To be safe, to be secure, to be comfortable, to be surrounded by pleasant things. That's a good Sunday afternoon, right? But what Jesus is saying in this passage is that you can lose your life through pursuing only that. Not necessarily that those things are bad things, but if those are in control of your life, then you can lose your life. And then he goes, this is the pathway of the perishing. Or Jesus says this, you can take another path and arrive at eternal life. Notice that he adds in this world. Hating your life in this world means that you will choose to do things that look foolish to the world. 
You will deny yourself of things. You will take risks for the kingdom and embrace the path of suffering, suffering for the sake of love. This, Jesus says, will lead to eternal life, not death. And as I reflect on that, I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a hard passage to follow that you forsake. And then my mind kind of went crazy. And there's a couple cross references that I want to give us. And then we're going to really close. But I, instead of me making these grand applications of that you got to do this, you got to do this, I figured we would just allow scripture to do that for us this morning. Luke 9, 23 through 24, this is a, a parallel passage where it talks about this passage. It says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he, one, will save it. And let's look at this passage. This one's tough. You may know this one by heart, but Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that you today? Has your life, because that's what Jesus is calling us to. If you love your life in this world, you'll lose it. But if you hate your life in this world, you'll keep it for eternal life. The only way that's possible to live that out is to crucify our lives daily. And crucifixion was the most evil way for someone to die. I mean, it was brutal. It was harsh. We can't, I mean, in our politically correct world, it was, it was horrific. I mean, you can't even really put words to how bad it was. But to think about it was painful, it was terrible, horrific. But that's what that language that Paul uses, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. It is a call to die to ourselves. So do you die to yourselves daily? Because that's the battle. That's the tension. And it's one that we probably will not resolve this side of heaven but the fight should be there because once sin ran the score up on us, that we didn't have an option. He dominated us completely. We were dominated by our sin. But when Jesus paid the price for our, our sin and we've trusted him as Lord and Savior, then we have a choice. We no longer have to be dominated by sin because we can die to ourselves at that point because it's not our power. It's his power living in us that we have that freedom. And that we can live out John 12, 25. So back to my question that I ask you, and we're going to finish with one more verse. Are you more comfortable? Or are you more conformable? Because if I think about my life in this world, man, I choose comfort a lot. But I want to be this conformable person that says, I don't want to be conformed to this world, but I want to be conformed to the image of the sun. And like I said at the beginning, if you, if you picture your life as a, a lump of clay, that he is molding, that he's shaping us, that that's a painful process at times because we go through hard times, we go through suffering. You think about what Jesus is going to face. It's not easy. Following Jesus is not easy. We're going to be molded. We're going to be broken at times, but he is going to shape us into his image. So are you more comfortable? Are you more conformable? What does it mean to be conformable? Well, we no longer ignore his instructions. Because I think in the world that we live in, do we ignore God's instructions? Man, a lot. It's caring about what Jesus cared about. See, when Jesus sees that people are perishing, void of this relationship with Jesus, that should break our hearts. That's why a gift of a shoebox, I mean, that's a slow clap. That's a good thing. But the gift of the gospel, that's a big deal. That kids around the world, that's why we do this. It's not just to get you to do something. It's that we should care about what Jesus cares about. That's a big deal. And we should move anything we could do to leverage our lives for that. So that means that we're conformable. It's living as Jesus lived. I think about that. And I ask the question often in my life, do I live my life like Jesus lived his life? Because Jesus had this very high moral standard. And I think we compromise that at times because we live more conformed to this world than we do the other. And that's the challenge because, and I've, I've thought about this a lot, that there's this, and my brain's shooting to a passage, I'm really bad at this time, so that I know the verse and what it says, but I don't know the reference, so you can Google it and find this reference. Uh, but be holy for I am holy. And I should know that as a pastor, but I don't. Um, the references sometimes elude me. But that's the call on our lives, to be holy and set apart like he is set apart. And that, in order for us to do that, we have to die to what we desire 
and say, God, I'm going to surrender that to you. We die to our opinions, our preference, our, our likes, our will, to the world that we know. And this is where we end with Galatians 6.14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm going to read this one more time, and then I'm going to pray for us. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You think about the things that we boast in, the things that we find significance in. May I never boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me. Think about that. The world and if, if we get lost in the world, we've got to crucify it. It has to die in us because we'll lose our lives in this world. But if we hate our lives, then I to the world, then we'll find truly life. So are you more comfortable or conformable? Let me pray for us.